Chapter thirty six of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty six William Jennings Bryan. It was a wonderful apparition of vitality that burst in on me one morning at the Hotel Cecil, where I had called to breakfast with William Jennings Bryan now sir he said with that air of plunging straight into business so characteristic of the american i find my resolution at the interparliamentary conference is down for nine thirty and to save time i've had to breakfast early so that while you are breakfasting i can talk right along and seizing a chair he sat down and talked right along there is about him the primal energy and directness of nature he is a niagara of a man a resistless torrent of inexhaustible force thundering along in a sort of ebullient joy mind and body in perfect equipoise it is not the hurry and frenzy of the city that possess him but the free untrammelled spirit of the west with its spacious skies and primeval forests and illimitable prairies he has the simplicity of a son of the plains his mind moves in large curves and sweeps along in royal unconsciousness of academic restraints and niceties. You do not remember the proprieties in his presence any more than you would remember them in the presence of a hurricane, for he comes right down to the bedrock of things, and his hammer rings out blows that seem to have the universe for a sounding board as he talks you understand that thrilling scene when the young unknown nebraskan stamped the democratic convention in eighteen ninety six and swept all rivals out of the field with his cross of gold speech it is a speech of which he is probably not very proud to-day it has passed into the lumber-room of history and he knows that the reform of american currency will have to be achieved by methods other than the jejune scheme that brought him into prominence but the incident revealed his enormous dynamic power even though it did not reveal an equivalent quality of statesmanship before he has spoken his presence arrests you you cannot come in sudden contact with him without a certain shock of expectation he leaps out at you as it were from the drab canvas of humanity the big loose frame the massive head the bold sculpture of the face the black lustrous eyes so direct and intense the large governing nose the wide straight mouth with lips tight pressed and the firm broad chin together convey an impression of decision and power which is irresistible it is difficult to believe that a man can be so strong as mr bryan looks together with this appearance of elemental power there is the sense of an elemental gentleness a natural chivalry a frank and human kindliness he has the unaffected courtesy not of one who stoops to conquer but of one who is unconscious of social or intellectual fences he lives as it were on the broad free plain of a common humanity his face is typically american it is often said that the american type has not yet emerged from the welter of races out of which the ultimate american people are to be fashioned but there is a dominant profile visible it is the profile of mckinley and bryan it is the profile which suggests quite startlingly the characteristics of the aboriginal race of north america and raises in perhaps the most piquant form the problem of the influence of climate on physique and character mr bernard shaw gives so large a place to that influence that he seems to suggest that if only our dull english broadbents could arrange to be born and to live in ireland they would become as imaginative and bright-witted as himself certainly the tendency of the americans to revert to the physical contours of the red man a tendency which has been commented on by many observers including mr ford maddox Huffer, whom i found after his visit to america deeply impressed with the phenomenon is too well marked to be merely fanciful mr bryan is typical too of the american in temperament and intellectual outlook it is the temperament of youth incident to a people in the making and to a light and stimulating air the wine is new in the bottle it lacks the mellowness of the vintage that has been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth 
it is exhilarating and expresses itself in a sanguine and dazzling optimism that goes out to meet great adventure with a challenging heart there is a certain crudity in mr bryan's mind it seems the product not of centuries of civilization but of a civilization that has just realized itself the obvious has still the bloom of the dawn upon it and that which the sophisticated mind takes for understood is subject to elaborate exposition his intellect is bold rather than subtle masculine rather than meticulous his eye ranges over great horizons and sees the landscape in the large his weapon is not the rapier but the hammer of thor he is elemental and not precious if you talk to him of poetry you will find him indifferent to the heavy-laden incense of keats but quickly responsive to the austere note of milton for his mind is charged with the spirit of new england puritanism and if ever a monument is erected to him it should be on plymouth rock for had mr bryan not been a politician he would have been the greatest revivalist of our time his qualities as a statesman have yet to be proved and may be very seriously doubted but his qualities as a preacher are indisputable he is before all else the hot gospeller of national righteousness even in appearance with his expanse of white front and his black cravat he suggests the methodist divine his appeal is always to the moral conscience the name of the almighty is as familiar on his lips as it was on the lips of gladstone and it is the highest tribute to his sincerity that in employing it he never gives you the sense of canting the truth is that he lives in an atmosphere out of which our politics have passed no one to-day in the house of commons ever touches the spiritual note when we say that oratory is dead we mean that faith which is the soul of oratory is dead oratory fell to earth when gladstone and bright ceased to wing it with spiritual passion and to associate the thunders of sinai with the ideals of politics now the supreme fact about mr bryan is that he mingles religion and politics in the same breath they are not distinguishable from each other but are fused into one theme his talk is like the talk of cromwell so full is it of biblical imagery and phraseology thus speaking of the political awakening in america he passes naturally to the moral and spiritual awakening as its basis Quote, are you aware that the country has been going through a great revival of religion certainly it is true don't you know about the evangelistic movement that most impressive movement towards a more personal realization of the gospel it has taken possession of the churches everywhere it has quickened religion it has brought in the men and organized them and there is a new note in popular religion while it is quickened on its personal side it has come to a new understanding of the social significance of christianity christ said no it was one of the disciples but the authority is pretty good still he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now the time has come he says when it is perceived that religion is a concern that has to do with the family the city and the nation with business and with politics as well as with what is called the individual life no man can individually be a religious man who commercially acts irreligiously or politically consents to irreligious measures what we are witnessing is a revival of religion largely concerned with men and women as members of society End quote. all his political thinking springs out of this soil of moral ideas the wages of sin is death he says to the nation as much as to the individual in the case of a nation a century may elapse between the sowing of the wind and the reaping of the whirlwind but the one follows the other he stands by the historic view of america as the land of the ploughshare and not of the sword not that he is afraid of unsheathing the sword in a just cause he himself raised a nebraskan regiment in the spanish-american war and was himself its colonel but aggression he hates what is the growth of militarism for 
if it is due to a fear of labor troubles why not deal with them through the department of justice rather than through the department of war if it is due to imperialism then imperialism attacks the most vital christian principle namely the propagation of good by example what has imperialism done in the philippines it has sought to propagate good by force it has been a policy of philanthropy and five per cent sir it can't be done philanthropy goes to the wall the five per cent blinds us to the real welfare of the filipinos the bible plan of propagating good is by example so live that others seeing your good works may glorify your father so with the tariff issue it is the moral aspect of free trade on which he dwells the open door is the gospel of brotherhood build up tariff walls and you build up national enmities and armies and navies to support them break down tariff walls and you establish a common basis of peace between the nations yes i am a tariff reformer he said to me i had mentioned his visit to glasgow where he had heard mr chamberlain open his fiscal campaign but a tariff reformer with us you know is a free trader protection is a stumbling block to progress and peace it is a cruel injustice to the poor for taxes upon consumption always bear heaviest upon the poor and lightest upon the rich under taxes on consumption men contribute not in proportion to property and income but in proportion to what they eat drink wear and use taxes on consumption are taxes upon our needs and men's needs being created by the almighty are much more nearly equal than their possessions no sir to me the fact that protection taxes our needs and free trade taxes our possessions that the taxation of protection is cunning and concealed and that the taxation of free trade is open and direct is final it is a bright bright with a slight american accent that you think as the broad stream of his talk flows on i sail from headland to headland says bright while gladstone navigates every creek and inlet and so it is with bryan his canvas bellies with the great wind he does not tack and trim but keeps to the well-charted highway and the open sea it is this breadth of appeal this large sculpture of his thought the result of that moral purpose which gives it simple unity and coherence that has made him one of the most powerful popular orators in the english-speaking world it is true that he has twice failed to win the presidency but his failures were more dazzling than the triumphs of other men there has been nothing in political annals to compare with those two great presidential campaigns he went through the country like a whirlwind merely as a physical performance they stand alone in the four months electioneering in eighteen ninety six he travelled eighteen thousand miles and delivered twenty one hundred speeches to an estimated total of eight million people during the last few weeks he often spoke thirty-five times a day and once forty-one times his force never faltered and his passion never lost its hold i saw women in hysterics and men with tears in their eyes at his entrance says an american journalist describing the scene at a meeting in indianapolis where the great audience had sat in a temperature of a hundred and ten degrees waiting hour by hour for the candidate who had been held up by the train i timed the length of excitement it was twenty minutes before bryan could sit down his power owes nothing to rhetorical trickery his voice is rich deep and musical but he does not use it with conscious display he talks quite simply and naturally and uses few gestures the physical resources which this titanic campaigning indicates are a tribute to the stock from which he springs so far as i have been able to discover he told me with a smile i embody the british isles for my ancestry is english irish and scotch the intensity of the feeling against him among the republican and propertied classes can only be indicated by recalling the attitude of english society towards sir h campbell bannerman at the time of the war i had a sudden revelation of it at dinner one night when seated beside an american lady 
at the mention of his name her serenity vanished and she burst into a torrent of invective that left him a moral ruin but hateful as his democratic doctrines are to his opponents no one ever challenges their sincerity or doubts his honesty he has carried that honesty into business he left the law for journalism and owns a newspaper the commoner at lincoln nebraska and in that paper he never allows any trust made article to be advertised that nevertheless he draws an income of six thousand pounds a year from it is a pleasant evidence that it is possible to be at once honest and prosperous even in america and indeed whether he becomes president or not the fact that a man of this type is one of the most popular figures in america is a reassuring feature in the dark sky of its future all the elements of ruin and combustion are visible a constitution rigid and inelastic and founded on unqualified individualism has allowed the growth of a trust system which holds the state in the hollow of its hand the land of the free has become a land of economic serfs its franchises exploited by financial highwaymen its municipalities sinks of corruption its necessaries shut out by a tyrannous protective tariff built up by the republican party at the dictation of the plutocratic power that dominates it underneath is the volcanic fire of an insurgent people if the disaster that threatens is to be escaped it can only be by a new war of emancipation that will strike the fetters of private monopoly off the limbs of the democracy it is the economic liberation of a people that is the real problem of american politics and as you look at the clear resolute eye and the large masterful face of mr bryan you feel that here is a man who will play a large part in that liberation we may doubt whether he will carry it through for his mental processes are too elementary for the practical engineering work of politics there will need to be other more instructed more acute more scientific minds to plan the new social structure but he will supply the moral fervor and the large purpose he will not manipulate the storm but he will give it impetus and direction his task in a word is not that of statesmanship but of revivalism and it is as the field preacher of politics that he will do his best service to his country. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 of A Prophet's Priests and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37 Lewis Harcourt what i really think said mr harcourt what you really think interrupted the other laughing is known only to mr lewis harcourt and his maker mr harcourt smiled his inscrutable smile and proceeded the thrust glanced off the impenetrable corslet but it expressed what one feels about this dominating masterful figure that sits so tight in the saddle wears ever an unruffled front turns aside the smashing blow with a jest seems never hurried never worried pursues his purpose with such stillness that he is forgotten until the mine explodes and the match that fired it is seen in his hand the lightnings play about the path of mr winston churchill mr harcourt advances in the shadow unobtrusively unnoted except by the few watch him casually and he seems but a spectator of the game amused and interested but never caught in its central swirl a man after mr george russell's own heart carrying with him the atmosphere of the eighteenth century full of worldly ironic wisdom rich in stories of men and events too fond of pulling the mechanism of the watch to pieces ever to become a wheel in its works that is the superficial view of mr harcourt behind this easy imperturbable exterior you find one of the most subtle most far-seeing most unswerving influences in politics 
it was the intrigues of young harcourt that upset my apple cart lord rosebery is reported to have once said the saying if authentic was not quite true the man who upset lord rosebery's apple cart was lord rosebery but those who know most of the intricate story of those troubled years when sir henry campbell bannerman was holding aloft the old flag surrounded by open enemies and cold friends know how much of the ultimate triumph was due to the astuteness and passionless loyalty of mr harcourt i would rather have him at my back in a row than any man in politics mr harcourt bides his time he has the rare gift of immeasurable patience jacob toiled for laban fourteen years but mr harcourt toiled for his father twenty he gave up not only his youth but his maturity to that filial service he took on himself the humblest secretarial tasks he learned shorthand and typewriting to facilitate his father's work he sought no place for himself he drudged seventeen hours a day over his father's budgets he grubbed among blue books and dusty documents he was over forty before he sought a seat in parliament even when he entered the house he was content to remain silent to wait he was to the world just lulu sir william's son an amiable young man devoted to his father the shadow of a great name when he was given a place in the ministry he had not uttered a word in parliament and there was a certain justice in the allusion to him as an interesting experiment the phrase tickled him i have a letter from him signed the interesting experiment he delivered his first parliamentary speech as a minister of the crown and he came into his kingdom at a stride his long apprenticeship was over and a new force of first-rate possibilities was added to the drama of politics he emerged in a day from the obscurity of twenty years into the front rank of the conflict equipped with every parliamentary resource knowing all the inner workings of the machine familiar from his childhood with the great figures of the past gladstone disraeli salisbury astute serene unfathomable with the suavity of conscious power and most dangerous when he was most suave the glove was velvet but the hand within was iron to-day mr harcourt stands out as one of the three men in the liberal party to whom all things seem possible political life never furnished a more startling contrast in temperament and outlook than two of those three furnish the one eager restless inquiring passionate modern as the morning's news sheet drinking life in great feverish draughts as if he feared that every moment would snatch the goblet from his lips forever a mountain torrent in spate the other calm and secure cool and calculating living as if he had all eternity to work in as if he had the key to every problem and had tasted all that was in the cup of life the orbit of the one incalculable the orbit of the other known to the fraction of a second for mr harcourt has his roots in the past he treads in the established tradition of british statesmanship to him the world is still divisible into whigs and tories the old party lines still plainly mark the path before him he will never lead a social revolution he will never blaze out into any raging tearing propaganda he will never desert the tabernacle and if ever the old guard comes into action on the evening of some waterloo it will be mr harcourt who will lead the van in a word he is for the party first and last for liberalism as he understands it and as his father understood it for liberalism is the instrument of sober considered progress upon familiar lines yielding here a little and there a little to the fierce clamour of the new time with its new strange voices but keeping ever to the great trunk road of which walpole was the engineer in the eighteenth century and gladstone in the nineteenth how far a mind so rooted in the past so remote from popular sympathies and the spirit of the modern democratic movement 
so governed by a conception of society organically unchanging can control the lightnings that flash in the political sky of the twentieth century and bring them into the service of the cause to which he is devoted is one of the most interesting problems of the future it is the problem of liberalism itself the problem of how far the principles of liberalism which have worked out the civil and religious freedom of the people can be successfully applied to securing their economic freedom and their liberation from the serfdom of circumstance and the wrongs of social injustice few men have appealed less to the gallery than mr harcourt he does not scan far horizons he does not declare any vision of a promised land he has no passionate fervor for humanity and is too honest to pretend to any he is a practical politician with no dithyrams he loves the intricacies of the campaign more than the visionary gleam the actual more than the potential present facts more than future fancies he is the man without a dream but he is the type of man who brings the dreams of others to pass the builder who translates the imagination of the architect into terms of wood and stone other men will prophesy he will perform other men will create the atmosphere of change he will give it form and shape he is the man who puts things through there has been no more striking feat of supple capacity combined with unyielding purpose than his conduct of the small holdings act last session his smile is more potent than the speeches of other men he has you unhorsed with a phrase and when you think to catch him napping you find that he has all his battalions within earshot ready to descend on you like an avalanche he is the organizer of victory the general who will not lose a gun if his possibilities are not realized it will be because in his secret heart he distrusts the eager movement of the time and conceives his function to be that of a check upon its enthusiasms rather than an inspiration and because he has too much of the spirit of the grand seigneur to be entirely at home in the heat and dust of these democratic days to the general he will always be a little caviar the general is not responsive to persiflage and elaborate irony mr harcourt has the manners and the mental habitudes of the ancien regime he would not pass for a parvenu you would not associate his origins with dry goods his philosophy is that of walpole and it is of that statesman more than any other that he reminds you there is about him nothing of the hurry of the twentieth century and no suspicion of its feverish intellectual unrest the riddles of the universe do not disturb him he is the man of leisure and of taste who is very pleased with the world and entirely at home in it and who has the security and ease that come from generations of spacious life if he drops into poetry you expect it to be horation and when he tells a story it has the flavor of the great world he suggests ancestors knights in armor bishops in lawn sleeves stalwart eighteenth-century squires striding over ploughed lands with a gun and drinking their three bottles at night in georgian mansions masterful men all lords of many acres politely familiar with the classics their walls hung with lely's leering ladies and kneller's unimaginative wigs he is at once curiously like and unlike his father he has sir william's great height he stands six foot two or so but he is as lean as cassius while his father's girth was falstaffian sir william was a famous trencherman with the constitution of a norse hero his son is delicate and fastidious and when he comes into the room he looks for the draughts he has much of his father's wit but none of his father's irascibility he smiles urbanely and darkly where his father thundered he has the olympian manner of sir william but it is more restrained and men never joke about his plantagenet descent though to his father's royal pedigree he adds another kinship with royalty through his mother a clarendon 
the toast of sir william harcourt and the rest of the royal family is never adapted to his case but he is not indifferent to the other branch of the family and is a close friend of the king whom he entertains at nunham in regal state for he has great wealth through his wife the daughter of the late mr w h burns of new york the heavy untuned voice like the late duke of devonshire's the voice of an authentic aristocracy broken i suppose in the view halloo of generations of fox-hunting forebears is not adapted to rhetoric but his speeches are of the same vintage as sir william's and when he rises the house knows that it is going to have some innocent merriment sometimes his merriment is out of touch with the modern sentiment as in the case of his speeches on the woman suffrage question which would have done very well no doubt in his own eighteenth century but ring a little unpleasantly in ours there is a certain incongruity between a man of such powers and his office it is like hackenschmidt wheeling a perambulator but he wheels it astonishingly well and seems to enjoy the task he has raised the office of first commissioner of works to a level that it had never reached before he has shown in it the same managing spirit that he revealed at the home counties liberal federation for the triumph around london in nineteen o six was largely his and which is restoring the ancient glories of the nunham seat which came to him in some embarrassment and decay he has saved the time of the house by simplifying the divisions he has reorganized the catering as adroitly as though he had spent his youth at spears and ponds instead of eton he has rearranged the dining-rooms and won the heart of everybody by his thoughtful stewardship he has inaugurated a great scheme for the development of the public galleries and has worked wonders in the royal parks raising wages cheapening refreshments giving facilities for games i know of no pleasanter fact about him than his consideration for the children he has some charming children of his own and perhaps that is why he remembers other people's little girls and boys who have no nunam park to play in his happy idea of making some of the animals in the zoo visible from the outside where the children play in regent's park is an illustration of this engaging side of his character and administration when he resigns the perambulator a parliament will discover behind this exterior of polite persiflage one of the ablest executive brains in politics a capacious mind moving without haste and without deviation to deeply considered ends subtle adroit resourceful omnia capax imperii but most capable of all in ruling men whom he knows through and through while he himself remains always something of a mystery for he has none of the self-revelation of mr churchill who throws all his cards on the table with the careless frankness of fox and turns out his mind with the joy of a boy turning out his pockets mr harcourt has his battalions masked what i really think he says what you really think you reply end of chapter thirty seven Chapter thirty eight of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty eight Augustine Bureau, KC. If a vote were taken in the House of Commons on the question of the most popular member, it is certain that Mr. Augustine Birrell's name would be in the first half dozen. For Mr. Birrell is an impostor who has been found out he affects to be a very gruff and menacing person he looks fiercely at you from below his corrugated brows he raps out an answer like a schoolmaster cracking an unruly pupil across the knuckles with a ruler he will have you understand sir that he is not to be trifled with you are to know sir that he is a very hard and ruthless taskmaster not at all the person to stand any nonsense sir do you not flinch before his fierce eyes sir do you not tremble at the roll of this terrible voice 
you do nothing of the sort for you have discovered long since that all this stage thunder is a deplorable make-believe the eyes that try to look so fierce are really twinkling with good humour behind the spectacles and the mouth that is closed with such firmness gives itself away by curving up at the corners into an abuncular benevolence you suspect that his hand is feeling in the abuncular pocket for half a crown he is indeed the whitewashed uncle of the golden age who comes up on the horizon like a black cloud and vanishes in an auriferous shower even the little boys in battersea park found him out for has he not told us that when he was wandering there excogitating his speech on the education bill all the youngsters pursued him with the refrain please sir will you tell me the right time that fact is a certificate when a little boy asks you for the right time please sir you are entitled to regard yourself as an amiable figure it is a mark of public confidence and esteem it is a tribute to you not only as a man of property and of leisure but as a man of that easy companionable exterior that placid frame of mind that invites the casual intrusion you have room and to spare in your capacious nature for the little amenities of life you may be thinking in continence but there are lollipops in your pocket i can imagine no more conclusive epitaph than this the children loved him and asked him for the right time there is an idea that mr birrell is a cynic that like walpole he believes every man has his price and that humanity in the lump is a very bad lot but his cynicism too is a masquerade it is a cynicism not of swift but of thackeray of whom he is reminiscent both in temperament and appearance his heart is so tender that he pretends he hasn't got one man delights me not nor woman neither he seems to say look at what a rogue you are sir and see what a merciless inhuman fellow i am i am an ogre sir and you are another we're all ogres and then down in his comfortable study in elm park road you run the reality to earth and discover in him a man full of the milk of human kindness sensitive to a fault endowed with a large and spacious tolerance bearing the burden of office with a sympathy and an anxious solicitude that brings to mind john redmond's axiom that only a man of the toughest fibre and indurated heart can fill the irish office under present conditions and that mr birrell has far too much feeling for the job mr birrell indeed has not the temperament which is adapted to politics parliament is no place for the man of feeling it demands either a rare moral elevation that is unconscious of the whips and scorns of office or a hard integument that is impervious to them the big motives move in the atmosphere of an attorney's office and he is the most successful who has the fewest scruples your principles must hang about you in falstaff's phrase lightly like an old lady's loose gown and you must be able to tack and turn with the veering wind you must have in fact the barristerial frame of mind emotionally detached from the cause it advocates cool agile and sincerely cynical cynical that is in fact and not in form if your conscience is a little seared so much the better for politics is a compromise with conscience and a seared conscience gives least trouble all this means that the lawyer and the business man are most at home in the atmosphere of politics now mr birrell is not a lawyer it is true that he has lived in chambers as a king's counsel and has earned his bread by the law but no man i know has less of the lawyer temperament less of the mental outlook of so typical a lawyer as let us say sir edward carson you cannot imagine mr birrell treating a client with the cold detachment of an algebraical problem he regards him less as an intellectual exercise than as a human emotion it is not enough to think for him he must feel with him or against him as the case may be his mind is never engaged alone his heart must be engaged too 
intellect and feeling are not in watertight compartments as they ought to be in every well-equipped lawyer they are one and indivisible this is a serious handicap for the politician it prevents him making out the best possible case for a thing in which he does not believe here we have the cause of the singular variations in mr birrell's parliamentary manner when he brought in the irish council's bill a legacy from his predecessor in the irish office he brought it in in the accents of defeat the key was minor the terms apologetic when at the close mr balfour rose and said the right honourable gentleman has brought in a bill which the house does not believe in and which i venture to say the right honourable gentleman does not believe in himself you felt that he spoke the truth and held the winning hand how different when mr birrell brought in his university's bill here he believed in his client wholeheartedly and his speech had an elevation and a conviction that carried the house as one man if i were a client with an honest case i would rather have him as my advocate than any man i know but as advocatus diaboli he should be given the widest berth he would throw up his brief and leave the devil in the lurch his candour is a fatal bar to the fulfilment of the promise which he gave in opposition he has no concealments none of that atmosphere of impenetrable mystery which all artful leaders cultivate and his valour is greater than his discretion which is a serious defect in a leader he does not suffer fools gladly or at all if he tires of a job he says so and his patience with bores and with peddling opposition is soon exhausted god takes his text and preaches patience says herbert but mr birrell does not listen to the sermon he is sometimes more than a little impatient with his own political friends you may as well tear up the bill he says hotly to a committee worrying him to concede something he won't concede and he foreshadows a new measure with the honest if impolitic announcement that two of his legislative attempts have been defeated and that if the third fails he will take his quietus it is this blunt frankfulness with himself and with the world that handicaps him as a statesman and makes him so dear to the house he is always himself never filling a part or playing for safety he is what in lancashire they would call jannock dissimulation vanishes at his breezy presence and his gay veracity and unequivocal good faith win all hearts even though they may lose votes he clears up the spirits and restores the humanities of debate he is like an oasis in the desert of arid talk bubbling with fresh waters and rich with verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways he has indeed the most individual note that is heard in parliament a certain mingling of mellow wit and mellow wisdom that is unique he brings with him the atmosphere of the library and moves as it were under the arch of a great sky his dispatch box may contain the draft of a bill but you suspect that lavengro a thin paper leather-covered dog's-eared volume is in his pocket or perhaps it is the religio medici or the apologia for his sympathies have no limits within the limits of noble literature and honest feeling he loves to hear the wind on the heath brother but he loves too the cool cloistral calm of newman he is true to the tradition of free churchmanship which he derives both from his father the rev charles m birrell a distinguished baptist minister of liverpool and from his mother a daughter of the rev dr gray one of the disruption fathers but he cares little for creeds either in religion or politics liberalism is not a creed but a frame of mind he says somewhere and he turns from the conflicts of the sex with unconcealed wrath in all things he cares more for the spirit than the letter for forms of faith let graceless zealots fight he can't be wrong whose life is in the right he would be the last man to scrape an acquaintance with on the ground of community of creed the first to greet you on the ground of human sympathy mr birrell in fact is not primarily a politician or a lawyer but a literary man of strong humanist sympathies 
it was as a literary man that he swam into our ken the freshness and sanity of obiter dicta made him a marked man we came to look to him for a certain generous wine with beaded bubbles winking on the brim a wine compounded of all the great vintages of the past but with a bouquet of all its own his wit has a distinction that is unmistakable it is at once biting and genial it is like the caricature of f c g in its breadth and humanity it does not wither you it buffets you with great thwacking blows but without malice he thumps you as though he loved you with a jolly humour that makes you the sharer rather than the victim of his fun the biralisms that he has scattered in his path are unlike any other blossoms of wit you know them as you know the demure pleasantries of holmes or the archaic solemnities of lamb the house of lords represent nobody but themselves and they enjoy the full confidence of their constituents or a pension of five shillings a week is not much encouragement to longevity or of mr tim healy he loves everybody except his neighbour his humour leaps out with a kind of lambent playfulness that makes you feel happy because it involves pain to none are you going to punish people he asked in a libel action before mr justice darling simply for having a lively fancy there wouldn't be many to punish interposed mr justice darling the licensed jester of the bench i don't know said mr birrell with that heavy gravity with which he loves to envelop his fun i don't know that many judicial vacancies would be created my lord it is the summer lightning of a gracious sky luminous but kindly there is in him a touch of chivalry that borders on quixotism a generous and uncalculating spirit that makes him the leader of forlorn hopes who but he would have surrendered the security of west fife in the midst of the khaki election to go out and fight northeast manchester it seems like an act of political fellow de se it meant years of exclusion from parliament and possibly the wreck of his whole career this disinterestedness so rare in politics was revealed in his acceptance of the irish secretaryship he had just borne the brunt of the battle at the education office and was entitled to a period of pause and to any office that he chose to ask for i am revealing no secret in saying that other men more discreet declined the most thankless task the ministry has to offer mr birrell took it and for the second time in succession became the centre of all the lightnings of the political sky charged with a bill which was not his conception and faced with the problem of cattle driving it is the highest tribute to his good sense and to his mingled firmness and reasonableness that he got through that ugly difficulty without disaster it might have meant coercion with all its calamitous consequences it is that dread hanging over the irish secretary that must make the office a nightmare for no ministry and no minister is safe from it convictions may be strong but external rule must rest ultimately upon coercion you cannot get rid of the danger until you have got rid of the system mr birrell knows that there is only one remedy for ireland he says and as he says it you recall lincoln's axiom that god never made one people good enough to govern another people not even though the governing people were so virtuous as the english and the governed so imperfect as the irish it is curious to recall that there was a time when mr birrell was regarded as a possible leader of the liberal party that possibility soon disappeared when he was seen in office he has none of the masterful grip of the house which mr asquith possesses and none of the swiftness and subtlety of mr lloyd george or mr balfour he wears harness uneasily is apt to be brusque and impatient to blurt out what is in his mind with a take it or leave it air and to give the impression that he will see you hanged before he will do this that or the other with all his delightful humour in short he has little suaviter in modo and little skill in the management of men and situations the wear and tear of office have left their mark more visibly on him than any other member of the ministry 
it is the price which the literary temperament has to pay for entering into the sphere of affairs a literary man in office is like a fish out of water his temperament is too nervous and apprehensive for the rough task of politics he may create the atmosphere of politics but it is the rude mechanic fellows to use cromwell's phrase the men of action the men who can handle facts rather than ideas and who are governed by mind rather than spirit who are necessary for statesmanship it is a significant fact that no essential literary man has ever made a first-rate position in practical politics and the succes d'estime of mr birrell and lord morley does not surprise by its modesty but by its relative magnitude it is like a defiance of a natural law and however boldly mr birrell writes his name on the statute book the real place to find his authentic signature will always be on the fly-leaf of a merry book would you return to the bar if the government went out of office he was once asked when we are kicked out of office he is said to have replied i shall retire with my modest savings to blank and really read boswell it is an enviable ambition we may wish him a long evening for its fulfilment end of chapter thirty eight Chapter thirty nine of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty nine Rudyard Kipling. Mr. Rudyard Kipling is the first Englishman to be awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. He is the first Englishman to be crowned in the court of literary Europe. He is chosen as our representative man of letters, while George Meredith, Thomas Hardy, and Algernon Charles Swinburne are still amongst us the goldsmiths are passed by and the literary blacksmith is exalted we do not know the grounds of the decision but we do know that mr kipling is not our king where o'flaherty sits is the head of the table where george meredith sits is the throne of english literature twenty years ago mr kipling went up in the sky like a rocket a rocket out of the magic east scattering its many-coloured jewels in the bowl of night never was there such a dazzling spectacle the firmament with all its stars was a mere background of blackness for its sudden splendour to-day we see that the firmament with its stars is still there what of the rocket it was a portent it proclaimed the beginning of a decade of delirium which was to culminate in a great catastrophe twenty thousand british dead on the south african veldt and the saturnalia of mafeking night in london the rocket that rose in the east completed its arc in the transvaal mr kipling in a word was the poet of the great reaction this voice sang us free says mr watson of wordsworth it may be said of mr kipling that this voice sang us captive through all the amazing crescendo of the nineties with its fever of speculation its barney barnatos and whittaker rights its swagger and its violence its raids and its music-hall frenzies the bard of the banjo marched ahead of the throng shouting his songs of the barrack-room telling his tales of the camp-fire and the jungle proclaiming the worship of the great god jingo what did they know of england those pitiful mean-souled little englanders prating of justice slobbering over natives canting about the righteousness that exalteth a nation righteousness had we not the mailed fist and was not the god of battles with us for the lord our god most high he hath made the deep as dry he hath smote for us a pathway to the ends of all the earth was not this fair earth ours by purchase and right of race had we not bought it from jehovah by blood and sacrifice we have strawed our best to the weeds unrest to the shark and the shearing gull if blood be the price of admiralty lord god we have paid in full and should we not do as we would with our own the indian in india the boer in the transvaal the irishman in ireland what were they but food for our imperial hopper 
paget m p was a liar a wretched emissary of exeter hall prowling around the quarters of gentlemen and cackling about the grievances of indians what did he know of india what were the natives that they should have grievances and the irish what were they but traitors traitors against the chosen people of the god of blood and iron of his inflamed vision that god beneath whose awful hand we hold dominion over palm and pine and labor what was the insurgence of labor but the insolent murmurings of the walking delegate for the chosen people were few they did not include the miserable rabble who toiled and who only became interesting to the godlike mind when they took the shilling and entered the lordliest life on earth the chosen people in a word had mr cecil rhodes at one end of the scale and the raw recruitry at the other and the empire was an armed camp governing by drumhead court-martial its deity a strange heathen god of violence and vengeance the war came and mr kipling turned contemptuously to the little street-bred people and commanded them to pay 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 it was their paltry share in the glorious enterprise of conquest and empire and when peace followed and down at roddingdean lady burne jones the aunt of the poet pointed the moral by hanging out the legend from naboth's vineyard hast thou killed and also taken possession and the people with the dregs of the war fever in them came about and demonstrated violently there emerged from the house a small dark man in spectacles with words of soothing and peace it was mr rudyard kipling face to face with the passions that he had done so much to kindle it is like a bad dream the tale of those years a bad dream with the strum of the banjo sounding through it a sort of mirthless demoniac laugh the laugh heard at its most terrible in the gentleman rankers we're poor little lambs who've lost our way ba 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 we're little black sheep who've gone astray ba ba gentlemen rankers out on the spree damned from here to eternity god have mercy on such as we ba ya ba what was the secret of the hypnotism he exercised it was partly the magic of an appeal perfectly attuned to the temper of the time israel had waxed fat and had turned to the worship of the golden calf it was the emergence of the baser passions the lust of power without a purpose of wealth without industry the gold of south africa had set up a fever in the blood it was as though the nation had left the temples of its ancient worship to fall down before the ball of the stock exchange and in its haste to grow rich it turned passionately upon the stupid little pastoral people that stood insolently in its path and drunk with sight of power we loosed wild tongues that had not thee in awe in that momentary flash of the recessional mr kipling pierced to the heart of the disease and delivered his own merciless sentence and partly it was due to the astonishing intensity of his vision coleridge said of Keen that to see him act was like reading shakespeare by flashes of lightning mr kipling sees life by flashes of lightning and sets it down in phrases that strike like lightning it is a world filled with sudden and sinister shapes not men but the baleful caricatures of men not women but menad sisters with wild and bloodshot eyes and fearful dishevelled locks with boys that drink and smoke and swear like dragoons animals that talk and machinery that reasons like a yellow journalist it is all a disordered frenzied motion soulless and cruel a world seen in a nightmare with all the intensity and literalness of a nightmare and all its essential untruth it is a fantastic mockery such as lurks in some wild poet when he works without a conscience or an aim there is the essential fact mr kipling is a precocious boy with a camera he has the gift of vision but not the gift of thought he sees the detail with astonishing truth 
but he cannot coordinate the parts he gives the impression of encyclopedic knowledge for everything he sees is photographed on his retina and everything he hears is written down in his brain there is nothing he does not seem to know from the habits of aquila the wolf in the jungle or the seal in the bering straits to the building of a bridge and the mechanism of a liner from the ways of fuzzy wuzzy in the desert to the ways of the harlot in whitechapel all lands are an open book to him the seven seas as familiar as the serpentine he uses the dialect of macandrew or mulvaney as readily as the jargon of the east and is as much at home in the ratcliffe highway as on the road to mandalay he is like the encyclopedia britannica fused with imagination at white heat and as the encyclopedia is to literature so is he to life he knows everything except human nature he knows all about life but he does not know life because he does not know the heart of man and to the intense vision of the boy he joins the passions of the boy i am told by one who was with him when he came from india to england to school that he remembers him chiefly by the pranks he used to play at the expense of a mild hindu kneeling on board at his devotions it was the instinctive dislike of the boy of the thing outside the range of his experience mr kipling has never outgrown that outlook it is the outlook of the unschooled mind vivid and virile confident but crude subject to fierce antipathies and lacking that faculty of sympathy that is the highest attribute of humanity he dislikes everything he does not understand everything which does not conform to that material standard which substitutes mayfair for sinai and speaks its prophecies through the mouth of the machine-gun a further cause of the unrivalled sway he exercised over the mind of the public was his fervid patriotism he sang of england with a defiance that sounded a challenge to the world and sent the blood singing through the veins it was said of general kleber that merely to look at him made men feel brave to read kipling made men feel martial and aggressive we went out like the children of hamlin town to the sudden rattle of a drum but the england of his hot passion was not the little england that we know the england of shakespeare and milton the england of a high and chivalrous past that freed the slave stretched out its hand to the oppressed and taught the world the meaning of liberty what do they know of england who only england know he cried scornfully as he marched on singing his fierce songs of an england that bestrode the world like a colossus treading the little peoples of the earth into the dust beneath its iron heel it was an appeal to the patriotism not of a people proud of its splendid services to humanity proud of having been ever foremost in the files of time but of a people filled only with the pride of material conquest it was not the soul of england that he loved and sang but the might of england the thunder of its battleships and the tread of its armies across the plains mr kipling in short was not the prophet of a philosophy or of an ideal but of a mood the world of his imagination is a world without meaning or a purpose for it is divorced from all moral judgments and values his gospel of violence leads nowhere except to more violence the lesser breeds are trodden in the dust but the chosen people are touched to no fine issues by their victory they have enslaved their foes without ennobling themselves justice and liberty mercy and tolerance all that gives humanity vision and nobleness is sacrificed to an idol whose nostrils breathe fire and smoke and whose eyes blaze with vengeance from all this it is doubtful if he is of the immortals with all his wonderful gifts his swift phrase his imaginative power his intellectual energy he is temporary as the moment's passion transient as the moment's hate for his vision is of the lightning fantastically real not of the sun sovereign and serene hence his astonishing influence while the mood to which he appealed was in the ascendant and his subsidence when that mood had passed he knows much of hate but he knows little of love 
and in literature as in the angel's recording book it is ben adam's name the name of him who loved his fellow men that leads all the rest he knows much of the street but nothing of the stars and indeed wrote tennyson what matters it what a man knows or does if he keep not a reverential looking upward he is only the subtlest beast of the field a reverential looking upward where in all that literature of passion and horror of the humour of the death's head and the terrible gaiety of despair of a world without a conscience or an aim do we find the recognition that man has a soul as well as faculties a moral law as well as the law of the jungle once only and in all the little ironies of literature there is none more significant than that mr kipling will probably be best remembered by that flash of a nobler inspiration when he turned and rent himself and the gospel that he preached for heathen heart that puts his trust in reeking tube and iron shard all valiant dust that builds on dust and guarding calls not thee to guard for frantic boast and foolish word thy mercy on thy people lord End of chapter thirty nine chapter forty of prophets priests and kings by alfred george gardiner this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty gilbert k chesterton walking down fleet street some day you may meet a form whose vastness blots out the heavens great waves of hair surge from under the soft wide-brimmed hat a cloak that might be a legacy from porthos floats about his colossal frame he pauses in the midst of the pavement to read the book in his hand and a cascade of laughter descending from the head notes to the middle voice gushes out on the listening air he looks up adjusts his pince nez observes that he is not in a cab remembers that he ought to be in a cab turns and hails a cab the vehicle sinks down under the unusual burden and rolls heavily away it carries gilbert keith chesterton mr chesterton is the most conspicuous figure in the landscape of literary london he is like a visitor out of some fairy tale a legend in the flesh a survival of the childhood of the world most of us are the creatures of our time thinking its thoughts wearing its clothes rejoicing in its chains if we try to escape from the temporal tyranny it is through the gate of revolt that we go some take it to asceticism or to some fantastic foppery of the moment some invent utopias lunch on nuts and proteid at eustace miles and flaunt red ties defiantly in the face of men and angels the world is bond but they are free but in all this they are still the children of our time fleeting and self-conscious mr chesterton's extravagances have none of this quality he is not a rebel he is a wayfarer from the ages stopping at the inn of life warming himself at the fire and making the rafters ring with his jolly laughter time and place are accidents he is elemental and primitive he is not of our time but of all times one imagines him drinking deep draughts from the horn of scrimmer or exchanging jests with falstaff at the boar's head in eastcheap or joining in the intellectual revels at the mermaid tavern or meeting johnson foot to foot and dealing blow for mighty blow with rabelais he rioted and don quixote and sancho were his vera britters one seems to see him coming down from the twilight of fable through the centuries calling wherever there is good company and welcome wherever he calls for he brings no cult of the time or pedantry of the schools with him he has the freshness and directness of the child's vision in a very real sense indeed he has never left the golden age never come out into the light of common day where the tone is grey and things have lost their imagery he lives in a world of romance peopled with giants and gay with the light laughter of fairies the visible universe is full of magic and mystery the trees are giants waving their arms in the air the great globe is a vast caravansary carrying us all in a magnificent adventure through space 
he moves in an atmosphere of enchantment and may stumble upon a romance at the next street corner beauty in distress may call to him from some hollow secrecy some tyrannous giant may straddle like apollyon across the path as he comes into carmelite street it is well that he has his sword-stick with him for one never knows what may turn up in this incredible world memory goeth not back to a time when a sword was not his constant companion it used to be a wooden sword with which went a wooden helmet glowing with the pigments of apollo these were the days when the horn of roland echoed again through roncesvalles and lancelot pricked forth to the joust and ever the scaly shape of monstrous sin at last lay vanquished fold on writhing fold ah le bon temps où j'étais jeune but he still carries with him the glamour of the morning his cheek still blanches at charlemagne's what a marching life is mine i burst in on him one afternoon and found him engaged in a furious attack on a row of fat books around which his sword flashed like the sword of sergeant troy round the figure of bathsheba everdeen his eyes blazed his cheek paled and beads of perspiration no uncommon thing stood out on his brow it was a terrific combat and it was fortunate that the foe were not as in the leading case of don quixote disguised in wineskins for that would have involved lamentable bloodshed as it was the books wore an aspect of insolent calm one could almost see the contemptuous curl upon the lip and the haughty assurance of victory i own it was hard to bear adventure is an affair of the soul not of circumstance thoreau by his pond at walden or paddling up the concord had more adventures than stanley had on the congo more adventures than stanley could have that was why he refused to come to europe he knew he could see as many wonders from his own back yard as he could though he sought for them in the islands of the farthest seas why who makes much of miracles says whitman as to me i know of nothing else but miracles to me every hour of the light and dark is a miracle miracles and adventures are the stuff of mr chesterton's everyday life he goes out on the sussex downs with his coloured chalks in the cavernous mysteries of his pockets there is always a box of pastels though the mark of the mint in his own phrase may be unaccountably absent and discovers he has no white chalk with which to complete his picture his foot stumbles against a mound and lo he is standing on a mountain of chalk and he shouts with joy at the miracle for the world has never lost its freshness and wonder to him it is as though he discovers it anew each day and stands exultant at the revelation it is a splendid pageant that passes unceasingly before him new and yet old as the foundations of the heavens and earth familiarity has not robbed it of magic he sees it as the child sees its first rainbow or the lightning flashing from the thundercloud most of us before we reach maturity find life stale and unprofitable a twice-told tale vexing the dull ears of a drowsy man we are like the blase policeman i met when i was waiting for a bus at finchley one bank holiday a lot of people abroad to-day i said interrogatively yes he said thousands where do most of them go this way oh, to barnet though what they see in barnet i can't make out i never see nothing in barnet perhaps they like to see the green fields and hear the birds i said well perhaps he replied in the tone of one who tolerated follies which he was too enlightened to share there'll be more at the exhibition i suppose i said hoping to turn his mind to the contemplation of a more cheerful subject ah the exhibition well i was down there on duty the day it was open and i never see such a poor show oh yes the gardens they're all right but you can see gardens anywhere despairingly i mentioned hampstead as a merry place on bank holiday well i never see nothing at hampstead myself i don't know what the people go for and there's a garden city there and crowds and crowds a-goin to look at it 
well what is there in it that's what i asked what is there in it i never see nothing in it the world of culture shares the policeman's physical ennui in a spiritual sense it sees nothing in it we succeed in deadening the fresh intensity of the impression and burying the miracle under the dust of the common day veiling it under names and formulas Quote, this green flowery rock-built earth the trees the mountains rivers many sounding seas that great deep sea of azure that swims overhead the winds sweeping through it the black cloud fashioning itself together now pouring out fire now hail and rain what is it ay what at bottom we do not yet know we can never know at all it is not by our superior insight that we escape the difficulty it is by our superior levity our inattention our want of insight it is by not thinking that we cease to wonder at it this world after all our science and sciences is still a miracle wonderful inscrutable magical and more to whomsoever will think of it End quote it is this elemental faculty of wonder of which carlyle speaks that distinguishes mr chesterton from his contemporaries and gives him kinship at once with the seers and the children he is anathema to the erudite and the exact but he sees life in the large with the eyes of the first man on the day of creation as he says in inscribing a book of caldecott's pictures to a little friend of mine this is the sort of book we like for you and i are very small with pictures stuck in anyhow and hardly any words at all you will not understand a word of all the words including mine never you trouble you can see and all the directness is divine stand up and keep your childishness read all the pedants screeds and strictures but don't believe in anything that can't be told in coloured pictures life to him is a book of coloured pictures that he sees without external comment or exegesis he sees it as it were at first hand and shouts out his vision at the top of his voice hence the audacity that is so trying to the formalist who is governed by custom and authority hence the rain of paradoxes that he showers down it is often suggested that these paradoxes are a conscious trick to attract attention that mr chesterton stands on his head as it were to gather a crowd i can conceive him standing on his head in fleet street in sheer joy at the sight of st paul's but not in vanity or with a view to a collection the truth is that his paradox is his own comment on the coloured picture there are some men who hoard life as a miser hoards his gold map it out with frugal care and vast prescience spend to-day in taking thought for to-morrow mr chesterton spends life like a prodigal economy has no place in his spacious vocabulary economy he might say with anthony hopes mr carter is going without something you do want in case you should some day want something which you probably won't want mr chesterton lives the unconsidered untrammelled life he simply rambles along without a thought of where he is going if he likes the look of a road he turns down it careless of where it might lead to he is announced to lecture at bradford to-night said a speaker explaining his absence from a dinner probably he will turn up at edinburgh he will wear no harness learn no lessons observe no rules he is himself chesterton not consciously or rebelliously but unconsciously like a natural element st paul's school never had a more brilliant nor a less sedulous scholar he did not win prizes but he read more books drew more pictures wrote more poetry than any boy that ever played at going to school his house was littered with books filled with verses and grotesque drawings all attempts to break him into routine failed he tried the slade school and once even sat on a stool in an office think of it g k c in front of a ledger adding up figures with romantic results figures that turned into knights in armour 
broke into song and added together produced paradoxes unknown to arithmetic he saw the absurdity of it all a man must follow his vocation he said with falstaff and his vocation is to have none and so he rambles along engaged in an endless disputation punctuated with gusts of rabelaisian laughter and leaving behind a litter of fragments you may track him by the blotting pads he decorates with his riotous fancies and may come up with him in the midst of a group of children for whom he is drawing hilarious pictures or to whom he is revealing the wonders of his toy theatre the chief child of his fancy and invention or whom he is instructing in the darkly mysterious game of gyping which will fill the day with laughter well said the aunt to the little boy who had been to tea with mr chesterton well frank i suppose you've had a very instructive afternoon i don't know what that means said frank but oh with enthusiasm you should see mr chesterton catch buns with his mouth if you cannot find him and fleet street looks lonely and forsaken then be sure he has been spirited away to some solitary place by his wife the keeper of his business conscience to finish a book for which some publisher is angrily clamouring for no clamour no book is his maxim mr chesterton's natural foil in these days is mr bernard shaw mr shaw is the type of revolt the flesh we eat the wine we drink the clothes we wear the laws we obey the religion we affect all are an abomination to him he would raise the whole fabric to the ground and build it anew upon an ordered and symmetrical plan mr chesterton has none of this impatience with the external garment of society he enjoys disorder and loves the haphazard with rossetti he might say what is it to me whether the earth goes round the sun or the sun round the earth it is not the human intellect that interests him but the human heart and the great comedy of life he opposes ancient sympathies to new antipathies hates modernism and science in all their aspects and tends more and more to find refuge in miracles and medievalism he is capable of believing anything that the reason repudiates and can stoop on occasion to rather puerile juggling with phrases in order to carry his point thus when some one says you cannot put the clock back meaning that you cannot put events back he answers with triumphant futility the reply is simply this you can put the clock back johnson with all his love of verbal victory never got so low as this no man indeed was ever more careless of his reputation he is indifferent whether from his abundant mine he shovels out diamonds or dirt you may take it or leave it as you like he cares not and bears no malice it is all a blithe improvisation done in sheer ebullience of spirit and having no relation to conscious literature he is like a child shouting with glee at the sight of the flowers and the sunshine and chalking on every vacant hoarding he passes with a jolly rapture of invention and no thought beyond but there is one thing and one only about which he is serious and that is his own seriousness you may laugh with him and at him and about him when at a certain dinner one of the speakers said that his chivalry was so splendid that he had been known to rise in a tram-car and offer his seat to three ladies it was his laugh that sounded high above all the rest but if you would wound him do not laugh at his specific gravity doubt his spiritual gravity doubt his passion for justice and liberty and patriotism most of all his patriotism for he is above all the lover of little england and the foe of the imperialist whose love of country is not what a mystic means by the love of god but what a child might mean by the love of jam Quote, my country right or wrong he cries why it is a thing no patriot could say it is like saying my mother drunk or sober no doubt if a decent man's mother took to drink he would share her troubles to the last 
but to talk as if he would be in a state of gay indifference as to whether his mother took to drink or not is certainly not the language of men who know the great mystery we fall back upon gross and frivolous things for our patriotism our schoolboys are left to live and die in the infantile type of patriotism which they learnt from a box of tin soldiers we have made our public schools the strongest wall against a whisper of the honour of england what have we done and where have we wandered we that have produced sages who could have spoken with socrates and poets who could walk with dante that we should talk as if we had never done anything more intelligent than found colonies and kick niggers we are the children of light and it is we that sit in darkness if we are judged it will not be for the merely intellectual transgression of failing to appreciate other nations but for the supreme spiritual transgression of failing to appreciate ourselves End quote. but sincere though he is he loves the argument for its own sake he is indifferent to the text you may tap any subject you like he will find it a theme on which to hang all the mystery of time and eternity for the ordinary material cares of life he has no taste almost no consciousness he never knows the time of a train has only a hazy notion of where he will dine and the doings of to-morrow are as profound a mystery as the contents of his pocket he dwells outside these things in the realm of ideas johnson said that when he and savage walked one night around st james square for want of a lodging they were not at all depressed by their situation but in high spirits and brimful of patriotism traversed the square for several hours inveighed against the ministry and resolved that they would stand by their country that is mr chesterton's way but he would not walk round st james square he would in johnson's circumstances ride round and round in a cab even if he had to borrow the fare off the cabman he is free from the tyranny of things though he lived in a tub he would be rich beyond the dreams of avarice for he would still have the universe for his intellectual inheritance i sometimes think that one moonlit night when he is tired of fleet street he will scale the walls of the tower and clothe himself in a suit of giant mail with shield and sword to match he will come forth with visor up and mount the battle steed that champs its bit outside and the clatter of his hoofs will ring through the quiet of the city night as he thunders through st paul's churchyard and down ludgate hill and out on to the great north road and then once more will be heard the cry of st george for merry england and there will be the clash of swords in the greenwood and brave deeds done on the king's highway end of chapter forty end of prophets priests and kings by alfred george gardiner